State Fair of Texas. The fair is paranormally haunted. No house required. Chapter 1. Opening day, the morning sun cast a golden hue over the State Fair of Texas, glistening on rides and stalls that promised excitement and thrills. As the hum of generators kicked in and the smell of fried food began to waft through the air, Corey Thompson leaned against his pickup truck, surveying the grounds. For Corey, the State Fair was a montage of memories, each year imprinted with moments of joy and wonder but overshadowed by the inexplicable. A full decade of chasing shadows, hearing whispers where there were none, and capturing eerie footage had turned this lively attraction into a maze of enigmas for him. With each annual event, Corey felt he was a step closer to uncovering the fair's ghostly mysteries. Across the grounds, the excited chatter of the Rodriguez family broke Corey's reverie. They were newcomers to Texas, having moved from California a few months earlier. Sergio and Rosa Rodriguez, with their teenage kids, Mia and Lucas, had heard so much about the fair, and their anticipation was palpable. Little did they know what awaited them. Did you know they say this place is haunted? Lucas nudged Mia, his eyes wide with a mix of fear and excitement. Mia rolled her eyes. It's just a way to attract more visitors, dummy. No, seriously. I overheard some kids at school. They said people have disappeared here. And some of the rides, they, well, they take you places. Rosa overheard the conversation and chuckled. It's all fun and stories, kids. Ghost stories are a part of every old place. Now come on, let's get our tickets. The buzz of opening day was electric. Families and tourists flocked to the entrance, their enthusiasm infectious. But as they approached the turnstiles, the air grew noticeably colder. People wrapped their jackets tighter, casting uneasy glances around, searching for the source of the sudden chill. Just then, old Mrs. Haverford, a staple at every fair with her popcorn stand, ambled over to Corey. She was known for her delectable buttered popcorn, but equally for her tales of the fair's eerie history. You feel that too, don't you, Corey? She rasped, her voice barely audible above the growing din. Corey nodded. Every year, Mrs. Haverford. Every single year. They say it's the souls, you know. The ones who never left, she whispered, her eyes clouding over. They want something, or maybe, they want to tell us something. Corey sighed. He had heard countless versions of the fair's haunted history. The ride operator who mysteriously vanished, the laughing children heard late into the night when the fair was deserted, the games that played themselves. But Corey had seen enough over the years to know that there was some truth to these tales. A sharp cry broke their conversation. A young woman stood frozen near the entrance, her hand outstretched, fingers trembling. It. It touched me. She exclaimed, her eyes darting around as if expecting to find someone, or something, lurking nearby. People gathered around her murmuring and casting nervous glances. Corey pushed through the crowd, his decade of experience kicking in. Hey, are you all right? He asked, his tone gentle. The woman nodded, her face pale. I just felt this. Cold hand grasped mine. But there was no one there. Corey frowned, his eyes scanning the entrance. The familiar cold breeze seemed to emanate from the very heart of the fairground, whispering secrets of the past. He turned to the Rodriguez family, who stood nearby, their excitement now tainted with apprehension. First time? He asked. Sergio nodded. 
Heard a lot about this place. Not all of it good. Corey offered a small smile. Well, the State Fair of Texas is unlike any other. But if you stick together and stay alert, you should have a good time. Oh, and if you experience anything unusual, come find me. Rosa looked concerned. Should we be worried? Corey hesitated. Just enjoy the fair. But remember, not everything here is as it seems. As the Rodriguez family ventured in, Corey couldn't shake off the feeling that this year, the fair's spectral residents were more restless than ever. And he was determined to find out why. Chapter 2 The Ferris Wheel of Souls Corey made his way through the bustling fairground, his steps leading him to one of the fair's most iconic attractions, the Ferris Wheel. It wasn't the largest or the most modern, but it was the oldest, having been a part of the fair since its early days. And like many old things, it carried its own set of tales. As Corey approached, he noticed a woman sitting on a nearby bench, her face buried in her hands, the weight of her grief palpable even from a distance. He approached her cautiously, sensing her connection to the wheel. Ma'am? Are you okay? He asked gently. The woman looked up, her eyes swollen from crying. It's my boy, she whispered. He. He never came off the ride. Corey felt a pang of sympathy. When did this happen? Last year, she murmured. We came for his birthday. He was so excited. He went on the Ferris wheel, and, and he never came back down. That's impossible, Corey muttered, more to himself. I would have heard about it. The woman shook her head. No one believes me. They said he ran off, that he'd come back. But I know my boy. He wouldn't leave me. Corey's instincts were sounding alarms. Over the years, he'd learned to trust these feelings. Do you have a picture of him? She nodded, pulling out a worn photograph. It showed a smiling boy, around ten with bright eyes and a mischievous grin. I'll keep an eye out, Corey promised. He wasn't sure how, but he felt compelled to help. He continued observing the Ferris wheel. It wasn't long before the familiar, eerie occurrences began. Though the ride was currently closed for maintenance, the sounds of children's laughter floated down. It was a merry sound, but in the context, it sent shivers down Corey's spine. To add to the mystery, the wheel started moving. Slowly at first, then picking up speed. The operator ran to the controls, frantically trying to stop it, but it seemed to have a mind of its own. After several terrifying moments, the wheel came to an abrupt stop, leaving the gondolas swaying. The operator, a grizzled man named Pete who'd been working the fair for decades, scratched his head in confusion. I swear, this thing is cursed, he muttered to Corey. Before Corey could respond, a shout came from a group of teenagers. They pointed at the Ferris wheel line, where a translucent figure of a child stood, seemingly waiting his turn. The spectral boy bore a striking resemblance to the photograph the grieving mother had shown. Is that? Dot dot question mark quote. Corey whispered to himself, feeling a mix of dread and awe. As he approached, the figure turned, locking eyes with him. Those eyes, full of curiosity and mischief, seemed so alive. The child smiled, and then, just as suddenly as he appeared, he faded away. The gathered crowd murmured, with many crossing themselves and muttering prayers. Corey, though, felt an odd sense of determination. This wasn't just another haunting. This was personal. Heading back to the mother, Corey showed her the photo. 
I think I saw your son, he said gently. She gasped, tears streaming down her face. Where? Where is he? He was in line for the Ferris wheel, Corey said, choosing his words carefully. He seemed happy. The woman sobbed, holding onto Corey for support. I just want him back, she cried. I promise, Corey whispered, I'll do everything I can. That night, as the fair's lights dimmed and the crowds thinned, Corey returned to the Ferris wheel. Armed with a voice recorder, a camera, and a determination to uncover the truth, he climbed into one of the gondolas. The ride began to move, the world below becoming a blur of lights. Corey tried to communicate, asking questions into the void, hoping for a response. Are you here? He asked. Can you tell me what happened? A soft voice, barely audible, replied, I just wanted to keep riding. Chills ran down Corey's spine. Do you want to come down now? Silence. Corey felt the weight of the task ahead. This wasn't just about one boy. It was about all the souls that the Ferris wheel had claimed. And he was determined to set them free. Chapter 3 Ring Toss Revenge in the Heart of the Fairground, nestled between the aromas of candy floss and barbecue, stood the Ring Toss Stall. A simple game that had been at fairs for generations. Toss a ring, hook a prize. But at this particular stall, the game wasn't the only thing that hooked people's attention. It started off as whispers among fairgoers. Tales of rings being thrown back at players with an uncanny precision. Some brushed it off as a gimmick, a modern addition to spice up a classic. But others, especially those who had experienced it firsthand, knew that there was more to the tale. It wasn't long before Corey caught wind of these tales. With camera and equipment in tow, he made his way to the ring toss. The stall itself was a brightly painted wooden structure, with rows of pegs and prizes ranging from plush toys to larger electronics. As he observed from a distance, a young couple stepped up to play. The girl, with a determined glint in her eye, took aim and tossed her ring. As it arced through the air, it was clear it would miss. But then, as if guided by an invisible hand, the ring reversed its direction and flew straight back at her, narrowly missing her head. Gasps rippled through the surrounding crowd. Corey quickly set up his camera, ensuring he captured the events. A few more brave souls tried their hand at the game, only to have similar experiences. Rings tossed returned with a force that was clearly not natural. Amidst the chaos and startled exclamations, Corey noticed a shadowy figure behind the stall. Translucent and almost faded against the backdrop of stuffed prizes, the ghostly apparition of a man in dated attire looked on, a mix of sadness and anger etched on his features. Corey approached, hoping to communicate. Who are you? He asked, his voice firm yet compassionate. The apparition stared, its gaze penetrating. I am, was, Samuel. Corey continued, Why are you here, Samuel? Why the ring toss? A heavy sigh emanated from the ghostly figure. This was my life, my livelihood. I was the best ring toss operator around. Everyone wanted to play at my stall, try their luck. But then, everything changed. As the ghost spoke, images flooded Corey's mind. He saw a younger Samuel, proud and full of life, operating his ring toss stall. But as the years went by, new, flashy games drew the crowds away. Samuel's stall was no longer the star attraction. Desperation and debt took hold, and one fateful night, 
Consumed by despair, Samuel met a tragic end right at his beloved stall. I just wanted to be remembered, Samuel's voice echoed, filled with sorrow. I wanted to be the best again. Corey's heart ached for the tormented spirit. Hurting others isn't the way, Samuel. You need to find peace, to move on. Samuel's gaze shifted to the returning rings. But this is all I have left. Corey thought for a moment, then spoke. What if we celebrated your legacy? Made this stall a tribute to the best ring toss operator the State Fair of Texas ever saw? A flicker of hope passed across Samuel's face. Do you think that would work? Corey nodded. I believe in second chances. Let's give your story the ending it deserves. Together, with the spirit of Samuel guiding him, Corey revamped the ring toss stall. The game's mechanics remained the same, but its story changed. A sign was put up, detailing Samuel's legacy, and soon, crowds gathered, not just to play, but to pay tribute to the legend of the ring toss. As days turned into weeks, the incidents of flying rings ceased. Samuel's presence became less frequent, his form less defined, until one day, he was gone. Corey knew Samuel had found his peace. The once tormented soul had been given a chance to rewrite his ending, and in doing so, the State Fair of Texas had regained a piece of its lost history. Chapter 4 The Mystic Dilemma Beyond the Noise and Attractions, nestled in a quieter part of the fairground, was a row of tents designated for mystics and fortune tellers. Among these was Madame Lysandra's tent, ornate and crimson, with the soft scent of sandalwood emanating from within. On this particular afternoon, a young woman named Clara, with fiery red hair and a skeptical gleam in her eyes, entered the tent. Rows of candles illuminated the room, and in its center sat Madame Lysandra, an older woman with streaks of silver in her raven black hair. Hello, dear. Looking for a peek into the future? Madame Lysandra's voice was soft, almost hypnotic. Clara smirked. Sure. Let's see what these cards have to say. Madame Lysandra began shuffling her tarot deck, her fingers dancing over the cards with practiced ease. As she laid them out, her expression shifted from confident to concerned. The cards are unclear today, she murmured. Suddenly, her demeanor changed. Her back stiffened, her eyes rolled back, turning stark white. When she spoke, it wasn't in her voice but in a deep, guttural tone that seemed to come from another time and place. Seeker of truths, the voice boomed, addressing an unseen presence. Beware the beast that lurks in the mist. It sees you. It knows. Clara, terrified, stood frozen. She'd come for fun, but this was anything but. The voice continued, directing its message to Corey, who was just outside the tent, capturing footage for his investigation. You dig too deep. The mist hides more than just memories. It hides a hunger that has waited for years. Beware! As suddenly as it started, the episode ended. Madame Lysandra's eyes returned to normal, and she looked disoriented, her breathing heavy. Corey rushed in, his face pale. What just happened? Clara, still shaken, pointed at the tarot reader. She. She was possessed. Madame Lysandra groaned, clutching her head. It's been happening more frequently. Spirits, entities, taking hold, delivering messages. I don't understand why. Corey, ever the investigator, pressed on. Have there been other possessions? Other messages? The tarot reader nodded. 
several. But this. This felt different. Darker. Determined to find out more, Corey visited the other mystics. As he delved deeper, a pattern emerged. Multiple mystics had been possessed, all delivering warnings, most of them vague, but all pointing to a looming threat. One elderly clairvoyant, with piercing blue eyes, gave Corey more insight. The spirits are restless because of the spectral vortex at this fairground. But there's something else, something older, malevolent. It hides in the mist, feeding off the energies, growing stronger. Corey, recalling the disorienting mist in the beer gardens, felt a chill. How do I stop it? The clairvoyant looked solemn. That, I do not know. But be cautious. This is no ordinary entity. It's been awakened, and it's hungry. Determined, Corey made it his mission to find out more about this beast in the mist. His search would lead him to ancient legends, tales of entities bound by rituals, only to be unleashed when the barriers between worlds weakened. The State Fair of Texas, with its strong paranormal energies, had become the perfect feeding ground. But knowledge was power, and Corey was not one to back down. The mist held secrets, and he was intent on uncovering them. Little did he know, the challenge would be greater than any he'd faced before, and the stakes higher than he could ever imagine. Chapter 5 the disorienting beer garden the Texas sun was unforgiving, beating down on the fairgrounds with an intensity that sent visitors flocking to shaded areas. One such refuge was the beer garden, an oasis for those looking to quench their thirst and escape the heat. At first glance, it was a typical setup, wooden tables, large umbrellas, and a rustic bar serving an array of local brews. However, as Corey soon discovered, the beer garden held secrets of its own. He'd heard the stories. Fairgoers entering the beer garden for what felt like minutes, only to emerge hours later, dazed and confused. Most laughed it off, attributing their lost time to one too many drinks. But Corey knew better. The consistent tales of disorientation and missing time were too frequent to ignore. He set up his equipment discreetly at a corner table, ensuring a clear view of the bar and its patrons. As the afternoon wore on, he observed group after group entering, laughing and joking, only to become progressively more bewildered as the hours ticked by. It was during one of these observations that Corey noticed her. A barmaid, distinct from the others. Where the rest of the staff wore modern uniforms, she was dressed in an older style, reminiscent of the early 20th century, with a long skirt and lace-up boots. Her hair, a deep shade of auburn, was tied up in a loose bun, and her eyes, an intense green seemed to constantly scan the crowd. What caught Corey's attention, even more, was her uncanny ability to be present at just the right moments. Whenever someone remarked about lost time or appeared particularly disoriented, she was there, refilling their glass or offering a comforting word. Hours passed, and as twilight approached, the atmosphere in the beer garden shifted. The ambient noise grew louder, the laughter more raucous. Yet, through it all, the mysterious barmaid remained a calm and steady presence. Corey decided it was time to engage. He approached the bar, camera rolling, and ordered a drink. As he waited, he subtly angled the camera toward the barmaid, capturing her movements. And then, the moment he'd hoped for arrived. A young man, clearly flustered, approached the bar, exclaiming, I swear, I just got here half an hour ago, and now it's dark? The mysterious barmaid glided over, her voice soothing. 
It happens to the best of us, dear. Here, have another on the house. As she poured his drink, Corey's camera focused on her. To his astonishment, as she moved away from the young man, her form began to fade, her outline becoming translucent until she vanished completely. Reviewing the footage, Corey felt a mix of excitement and trepidation. He had clear evidence of a ghostly presence, but so many questions remained. Who was she? Why was she in the beer garden? And what connection did she have to the disorienting mist and lost time? Determined to get answers, Corey delved into the history of the fairgrounds. He discovered that the beer garden was once the site of an old tavern, popular in the early 1900s. And among its frequent patrons was a barmaid named Lillian, known for her auburn hair and piercing green eyes. Lillian had disappeared under mysterious circumstances, her fate a mystery that haunted the local community. Armed with this knowledge, Corey returned to the beer garden the next evening. As the sun set and the mist rolled in, he called out to Lillian, hoping to communicate. To his surprise, she appeared before him, her form clearer than before. Why are you here? She whispered, her voice filled with sorrow. I want to help, Corey replied. Tell me your story. And so, Lillian recounted her tale. A story of love, betrayal, and a tragic end that bound her spirit to the tavern. The disorienting mist, she revealed, was her attempt to hold on to the patrons, to relive the happier times before her demise. Moved by her story, Corey made it his mission to free Lillian from her earthly bonds, ensuring that the beer garden would no longer trap unsuspecting visitors in its disorienting embrace. But the journey to release her spirit would be fraught with challenges, as the malevolent entity lurking in the mist grew stronger, feeding off the energies of the trapped souls. Chapter 6 The Carousel of Time The carousel, with its ornate wooden animals and lilting melodies, had always been a favorite attraction at the State Fair of Texas. However, as the paranormal activities around the fairground intensified, so too did the stories surrounding this seemingly innocuous ride. Visitors whispered of strange experiences while on the carousel. As it spun, they felt themselves transported to past fairs, hearing old-timey music, seeing people dressed in vintage attire, and even tasting treats no longer available. Corey, keen to investigate, staked out a spot near the carousel. As he watched, he noticed an older woman who rode the carousel multiple times, her face reflecting a myriad of emotions. He approached her as she disembarked after her third ride. Excuse me, ma'am, Corey began. I've noticed you've been on this ride quite a few times. Anything special about it? The woman, with silver hair and a distant look in her eyes, replied, It takes me back. I've been, riding, since the 60s. Intrigued, Corey invited her for a coffee. As they sat, the woman introduced herself as Eleanor and began her story. In the 1960s, this fair was everything to me. I met the love of my life, Robert, here. We'd spend hours at the carousel, dreaming of our future together. But fate had other plans. Robert was drafted for the Vietnam War and never came back. Tears formed in Eleanor's eyes. Every year, I return, hoping to catch a glimpse of our time together, the memories we made. Corey, moved by her story, decided to investigate further. His research into the carousel's origins unveiled an enchanting tale of love and loss. The carousel was crafted by a master carpenter named Theodore in the 1940s. He built it as a gift for his beloved, Catherine, 
to commemorate their time at the fair. Their love story, though brief due to the challenges of World War II, was intense and passionate. Theodore had promised Catherine that no matter where life took them, they'd always have the carousel to return to and relive their moments together. Corey's search led him to an old blueprint of the carousel's design. Scribbled in the corner was a note. For every turn, a memory returned. Following the layout, Corey was drawn to a particular spot just a few feet away from the carousel's platform. Digging carefully, he unearthed a dusty, old locket. Opening it, he found a black and white picture of a young couple, unmistakably Theodore and Catherine, with the carousel in the background. Etched on the back of the locket was a simple message, forever in a spin of love. Realizing the significance of his discovery, Corey approached Eleanor. I believe this belongs to the carousel, he said, handing her the locket. Eleanor, holding the locket, felt an immediate connection. She boarded the carousel one last time, clutching the keepsake. As the ride spun, the entire carousel glowed with a soft, golden light. Onlookers watched in awe as memories of fairs gone by played out like a movie around the carousel. When the ride came to a stop, Eleanor, tears streaming down her face, whispered her thanks. She felt a deep sense of peace, knowing she had helped bridge the past with the present. For Corey, the carousel's mysteries had unveiled a tale of timeless love. While he had many more paranormal occurrences to investigate, the carousel served as a poignant reminder of the enduring power of memories and the places that hold them captive. And as the fair continued, visitors to the carousel felt an added warmth, a gentle embrace from the past, as they created new memories to be cherished for generations to come. Chapter 7. The Possessed Crystal Ball The Mystics area of the State Fair of Texas was always dimly lit, with scented candles creating an otherworldly ambiance. Among the tarot readers, pendulum diviners, and aura photographers was Madame Zara, known for her crystal ball readings. Corey had heard rumors about this particular crystal ball, stories of possessions and spirits causing havoc. Today, he intended to find out the truth. Madame Zara was an older woman, with deep-set eyes and a presence that commanded respect. As Corey approached her tent, he could feel a palpable energy emanating from within. He watched from a distance initially, observing Madame Zara's interactions with fairgoers. Then he saw it, a swirling mist within the crystal ball which seemed to reach out and envelop a middle-aged man who was getting a reading. The man's eyes went blank for a moment, and then they filled with a malevolent gleam. Almost immediately, the man's demeanor changed. He stood up abruptly, knocking the table and causing a scene. As he walked away from Madame Zara's booth, he began to instigate altercations with anyone he crossed. A simple bump turned into a heated argument, spilled drinks led to full-blown fights, and soon, chaos reigned in the vicinity. Corey knew he had to intervene. Approaching Madame Zara, he inquired, what just happened? What's inside that ball? Madame Zara, looking exhausted and a tad fearful, whispered, a trapped spirit, one filled with anger and resentment. It looks for hosts, causing them to act on its vengeful desires. And how do we stop it? Corey pressed. The spirit needs to be banished back to the ball, Madame Zara responded, but it won't be easy. We need to confront it directly. Together, they followed the trail of disruption left by the possessed man. Finding him at the center of a large commotion, Corey approached cautiously, trying to get his attention. Hey! 
he shouted, can you hear me? The man turned, his gaze dark and piercing. Why should I listen to you? He snarled. You're not yourself. Corey tried to reason. Let me help you. Madame Zara began to chant softly, drawing the spirit's attention. The man, or rather the spirit controlling him, stared at her, momentarily distracted. Seeing his chance, Corey moved closer, trying to calm the man with his words. You don't belong here. Go back to where you came from. As Madame Zara's chant grew louder, the crystal ball, which she had brought with her, began to glow. The swirling mist inside grew thicker, and tendrils of it reached out, attempting to pull the spirit from the man. The possessed man resisted, thrashing and yelling, but Corey continued to speak to him, trying to reach any semblance of the man's true self. Fight it! Don't let it control you. After what felt like hours, the struggle reached its climax. With a final, deafening scream from the man, the spirit was ripped from him and drawn back into the crystal ball, which now glowed even brighter than before. Madame Zara, panting from the effort, quickly sealed the ball with a series of symbols, ensuring the spirit's containment. The man, now free from the spirit's influence, collapsed, disoriented but otherwise unharmed. Surrounding fairgoers, previously caught up in the chaos, began to regain their senses, confusion evident on their faces. Grateful for Madame Zara's assistance, Corey asked, how did the spirit get trapped in the crystal ball in the first place? Madame Zara sighed, it's a long story one of love and betrayal. The spirit was bound to the ball as a form of punishment, but over time, it grew stronger, more malevolent. Corey nodded, understanding the weight of the situation. You need to ensure it never escapes again. Madame Zara agreed. I'll retire the ball, place it in a location where its energies can be neutralized. As Corey left the mystic's area, he felt a mixture of relief and unease. The fair had many more mysteries, and he was determined to uncover them all. But for now, one more threat had been dealt with, ensuring the safety of the unsuspecting visitors. Chapter 8 Unearth Secrets The Texas sun hung low in the sky, casting long, dramatic shadows across the fairground. Corey, with his unwavering dedication to uncover the secrets of the haunted state fair, found himself in an old, somewhat forgotten building near the fair's perimeter. This building, aged by time and weather, housed the fairground's historical archives. As he flipped through yellowing photographs and documents, he became immersed in the fair's long and storied past. One particular black and white photograph caught his eye. It depicted the land, years before the rides, stalls, and crowds. The scene was grim. Soldiers, cannons, and the devastation of what appeared to be a great battle. Diving deeper, Corey found articles and testimonials detailing a significant battle that took place on the grounds in the 1800s. Thousands had perished, and the trauma and intense emotions from that day seemed to have imprinted on the land, creating the spectral vortex that now fueled the hauntings. A chill ran down Corey's spine as he realized the magnitude of what he had discovered. The paranormal occurrences weren't random, they were directly linked to the anguish and turmoil of that fateful day. Continuing his exploration, Corey came across a worn leather diary. The name, Amelia, was delicately embossed on its cover. Intrigued, he opened it, finding entries from a nurse who had tended to wounded soldiers during the battle. Amelia's words painted a vivid picture of the heartbreak, bravery, and despair she witnessed. But one entry, 
dated a few days after the battle, was especially captivating. The pain and suffering are too much to bear. Every night I hear their cries, the souls who can't find rest. An elder of our community, known for his knowledge of the spiritual realm, spoke to me in confidence. He believes there's a way to calm the restless spirits, a ritual that can offer them solace. Tomorrow, he has promised to guide me. Regrettably, the next few pages were torn out, but toward the diary's end, another entry provided a potential clue. The elder taught me well. We must recognize and honor the past, acknowledge the pain, and offer a way for the spirits to move on. I've hidden the ritual details where I know they'll be safe, beneath the heart of the fairground, waiting for someone who understands. Corey's heart raced. If he could find this ritual, he might be able to calm the vortex and give peace to countless troubled souls. The phrase, beneath the heart of the fairground, played in his mind. Where could that be? He decided to consult the fairground's blueprints, which, after some searching, he found stored in a dusty old tube. Unfurling them on a large table, he studied the layout. The heart seemed to point to the central hub of the fairground, the convergence point of all main paths. Realizing he might have to do some literal digging, Corey prepared to head to the central hub. Armed with a shovel and driven by the hope of discovering the hidden ritual, he felt closer than ever to unraveling the mysteries that haunted the State Fair of Texas. His quest for answers was gaining momentum, and the hope of restoring peace to the fairground was on the horizon. Chapter 9 the ghostly Hall of Mirrors The Hall of Mirrors was one of the oldest attractions at the State Fair of Texas. Over the years, many had laughed at their distorted reflections and lost their way in its maze-like corridors. But as the sun set and the cheerful buzz of the fair faded into the evening, the hall took on a more sinister tone. Corey had heard tales of the mirror maze being more than just a fun attraction of it acting as a window to the fair's storied past. Tonight, he intended to investigate these rumors. Taking a deep breath, he stepped into the dimly lit hall, surrounded by countless reflections of himself. As he moved deeper into the maze, Corey began to notice something unusual. Some mirrors didn't reflect the present but seemed to depict scenes from the fair's history. He saw children in vintage clothing laughing as they rode a carousel horse, couples sharing cotton candy in styles that had been out of fashion for decades, and soldiers, perhaps from the very battle he had read about, looking weary and forlorn. But it was a particular mirror that stopped him in his tracks. It showed not the past, but his own reflection, with one crucial difference. The reflection's eyes were wise and old, carrying the weight of countless years. This other Corey looked back at him with a stern expression and began to speak in a voice that echoed eerily in the silence. You seek to mend what's broken, to calm the storm that rages. But remember, every answer has its price, and every solution, its sacrifice. Confused. Corey responded, What do you mean? What sacrifice? The reflection smirked. You'll see soon enough. But for now, watch, listen, and learn from those trapped between worlds. As the cryptic message ended, the mirrors around Corey began to shimmer, and ethereal figures emerged. Ghostly apparitions, perhaps those lost in the great battle reached out, their hands touching the mirror surfaces. They seemed to be trying to communicate, their mouths moving silently, expressions filled with anguish and desperation. Corey, recalling Amelia's diary, knew he had to acknowledge and honor these spirits, to understand their pain. 
Drawing from a deep reservoir of empathy, he whispered, I see you. I hear you. Tell me what you need. The spirit's movements became frantic, their silent words morphing into a collective, wordless plea. And then, a revelation struck Corey. The mirrors, with their ability to bridge the past and present, might be the key to sealing the vortex. If he could harness their power, perhaps with the ritual Amelia mentioned, he could provide a gateway for these spirits to find peace. Filled with renewed determination, Corey made his way out of the Hall of Mirrors, the weight of his mission pressing heavily on him. The reflection's words about sacrifice lingered in his mind, casting a shadow of doubt and uncertainty. Yet, he knew he was on the right path. The mirrors held a power, a connection to the spectral vortex. He just had to figure out how to use them to bring an end to the haunting that plagued the fair. And as the night deepened, Corey, with the echoes of the past guiding him, prepared for the challenges that lay ahead, hoping to restore peace to a place filled with joy and memories. Chapter 10 The Phantom Food Court The food court at the State Fair of Texas was always abuzz with activity. Families choosing from an array of stalls, wafts of delicious aromas in the air, and the ever-popular deep-fried concoctions unique to the fair. Yet, amidst the scent of fried dough and grilled meats, there were unsettling reports of meals turning to ash or disappearing altogether from patrons' trays. This part of the fair had largely escaped Corey's attention until now. But recent events meant he couldn't ignore the paranormal disturbances any longer. As he approached, he noticed a family looking at their meal in confusion, the perfectly grilled turkey leg they had bought just seconds ago now a charred, inedible mess. Corey approached, offering words of comfort and assuring them they'd get a replacement. But as they left, he couldn't help but overhear their conversation about a mysterious figure they'd seen flipping burgers, a cook who looked out of place, like he was from another era. Curious, Corey decided to visit the stall where the family had bought their food. As he approached, he noticed an old photograph hanging on the wall. The image depicted the food court in the 80s, with a proud cook standing front and center. The caption read, Dennis, the heart and soul of our food court. 1980-1986 Joining the dots, Corey wondered if the specter of Dennis was the very cause of the mysterious food anomalies. But why? What had happened in 1986? What had led Dennis to haunt this place? As he pondered these questions, a stall owner approached him. You seem interested in that photo. Are you looking for Dennis? Yes, Corey responded realizing that this could be a significant lead. The stall owner, a middle-aged woman named Grace, had worked at the fair for decades. She remembered Dennis vividly. He was the best cook we ever had, she said with a sigh. He had a special recipe book, passed down through generations. But one day, he just vanished, and we never saw him or the book again. Corey's interest peaked. Do you have any idea where the book could be? Grace hesitated for a moment, then beckoned him to follow. She led Corey to an old storage area, dusty and filled with forgotten items. There, tucked under a stack of old trays, was a worn out leather bound book. Dennis's recipe book was inscribed in golden letters on its cover. Flipping through the book, Corey found more than just recipes. There were notes, annotations, and, intriguingly, rituals. One page detailed a ritual to communicate with the departed, a seance of sorts. Another spoke of appeasing restless spirits by offering them their favorite meals. 
The pieces of the puzzle were starting to fit. Dennis, perhaps trapped between worlds, might be trying to communicate, to finish something he had started. But to be sure, Corey would need to speak with him directly. That night, with the food court emptied of visitors, Corey and Grace set up the seance. Following the instructions from Dennis's book, they lit candles, set out dishes of Dennis's best recipes, and began the ritual. As the candles flickered, a gust of wind swirled around them, and the ghostly figure of Dennis appeared. He looked just as he did in the photo, but his eyes held a deep sadness. I never got to say goodbye, Dennis murmured, his voice echoing in the vast food court. I had plans, dreams, but they were cut short. I've been trying to reach out, to make things right. Corey, filled with empathy, responded, Dennis, tell us what you need. Let us help. Dennis pointed to his recipe book. The last page, he whispered. Turning to it, Corey found a heartfelt note, a message Dennis had wanted to convey to the world about following one's passion and never taking life for granted. By dawn, Corey and Grace had created a memorial for Dennis in the food court, displaying his note and celebrating his contribution. The phantom disturbances ceased, and the food court returned to its joyful, bustling self. Dennis's spirit, finally at peace, faded away, leaving behind a legacy of delicious dishes and a poignant reminder of the fleeting nature of life. Chapter 11 The haunted roller coaster as the sun dipped below the horizon, the neon lights of the State Fair of Texas gleamed even brighter. Families, thrill-seekers, and wanderers filled the sprawling fairgrounds. Laughter echoed around and the hum of thrill rides filled the air. However, the most prominent of all the rides, standing tall and imposing with its intricate loops and turns, was the historic roller coaster. Corey was drawn to it after hearing murmurs of apparitions appearing next to riders. Upon approaching the coaster, Corey noticed a long queue of excited patrons, their faces filled with a mix of anticipation and nervousness. But amongst them, he could discern a few individuals with expressions of sheer bewilderment. As one young woman exited, he overheard her saying, I swear, there was someone next to me when the ride started, and then. They were just gone. Finding a vantage point, Corey observed a few rides. As the roller coaster whizzed past him at one point, he could have sworn he saw translucent figures seated beside unsuspecting riders. He decided to delve deeper and sought out employees working at the attraction. Most seemed too busy or too disinterested to chat, but an old man, with skin weathered from years under the Texas sun and eyes that held centuries of stories, beckoned him over. He introduced himself as Samuel, and said he'd been associated with the coaster since, before it became a mechanical beast. As the two found a quieter spot, Samuel began recounting the history of the roller coaster. This coaster, he started in a gravelly voice, hasn't always been the symbol of fun. Many years ago, before all the safety regulations and the high-tech engineering, there was a terrible accident. The coaster derailed, leading to numerous injuries and deaths. Corey, absorbing the gravity of the revelation, realized this was the source of the apparitions. These spirits were reliving their final moments, trapped in a never-ending loop of excitement turned tragedy. Samuel continued, every year, as the anniversary of the incident approaches, the apparitions become more frequent, more restless. They're not malicious, just lost. Is there anything that can be done to help them? Corey asked, his commitment unwavering. Samuel hesitated, his eyes clouded with memories. 
After the accident, I tried everything. Prayers, rituals, even bringing in mediums. Nothing seemed to help. He paused, taking a deep breath. But there is something, an old pendant that's said to ward off spirits. It's been in my family for generations. With that, he slowly reached into his shirt and produced a beautifully crafted pendant, embedded with a deep blue stone that seemed to pulsate with an inner light. Why haven't you used it before? Corey inquired. I tried, Samuel admitted, but every time I approached the coaster with it, the pendant would become unbearably hot, as if warning me of a great danger. I've always believed that this pendant, combined with the right intentions, might be able to release the spirits. But the big event, I mentioned? That's tonight, the exact anniversary of the derailment. Corey, realizing the importance of the moment, offered to help. Together, we can do this. With night deepening, and armed with the pendant, Corey and Samuel approached the roller coaster. The lights of the ride flickered as they neared, and the atmosphere grew dense with anticipation. Holding the pendant high, Corey recited a prayer of release, urging the spirits to find peace and move on. The pendant began to glow, its light casting an ethereal blue hue around. Suddenly, the coaster's lights went out, plunging the area into darkness. But in that pitch-black moment, the souls of those lost began to emerge, their forms glowing faintly. Drawn to the light of the pendant, one by one, they touched it, their essence absorbed into the stone, releasing them from their eternal torment. As the last spirit disappeared into the pendant, the coaster's lights returned, now brighter and steadier than before. The oppressive atmosphere had lifted, replaced by one of peace and tranquility. Samuel, tears in his eyes, looked at Corey. Thank you, he whispered, his voice filled with gratitude. As dawn approached, the State Fair of Texas resumed its lively ambiance. The roller coaster roared back to life, its rails carrying screams of thrill and joy the shadows of its past finally laid to rest. Chapter 12 Mysteries of the Lost and Found with the Roller Coaster Incident Behind Him Corey's next stop was a place most would consider mundane, the Lost and Found booth. He had heard tales of personal items mysteriously returning to their owners without anyone's intervention. Curious to unravel another facet of the spectral vortex, he decided to investigate. The booth was a simple wooden structure, painted in bright colors and adorned with signs displaying items like hats, glasses, and toys. As he approached, he saw a flustered mother expressing gratitude to the attendant, holding her toddler's beloved teddy bear. I swear we never came to report this missing. She exclaimed, her confusion evident. The attendant simply smiled with a knowing glance and handed over the teddy bear. Once the mother and child left, Corey introduced himself and inquired about these strange occurrences. The attendant, a young man named Jake, shrugged. Happens all the time. People lose things, and then they come back. Sometimes, it feels like this booth has a mind of its own. Jake allowed Corey to look through the myriad of items that had been left behind over the years. As Corey sifted through the objects, he came across an ancient-looking medallion. It had a peculiar insignia which seemed oddly familiar. On closer inspection, Corey realized it was a combination of symbols, each representing the haunted attractions he had encountered so far. A miniature Ferris wheel, a ring, a crystal ball, a beer mug, a carousel horse, and a roller coaster. He sensed an intense energy emanating from the artifact. It was as if the medallion was a key, 
connecting all these paranormal events. Intuitively, he knew that this was what he had been searching for. Suddenly, the atmosphere around the booth grew chilly. Fog began to roll in, thick and fast, reducing visibility to nearly zero. Corey clutched the medallion, its cold metal pressing into his palm. Out of the dense fog emerged a silhouette, a spirit guide. This ethereal being was neither fully there nor completely absent, its form continuously shifting between the mist and clarity. Corey, it whispered, its voice echoing around him. You are close, but time is running out. I understand, Corey replied, holding the medallion up. This is the link, isn't it? The spirit guide nodded. It is the anchor, binding the spectral energies of the vortex. Each haunted attraction you've encountered feeds power into this nexus. You must go to the center of the vortex and use this artifact to seal it. And where is this center? Corey inquired. The spirit guide pointed towards the heart of the fairgrounds. There, where all lines intersect. But remember, the vortex is strongest at midnight. If you fail to seal it before then, the energy will be too powerful, and the fairgrounds will be lost forever. Understanding the gravity of the situation, Corey set off, with the medallion safely in his pocket. The fog began to lift, but he could still feel the eyes of countless spirits watching him, their hopes pinned on his shoulders. With every step, the energy grew stronger. His equipment buzzed and crackled, indicating the rising spectral activity. As he approached the center of the fairgrounds, he could see a swirling mass of energy, ethereal forms dancing around, merging and splitting in a chaotic ballet. Taking a deep breath, Corey held out the medallion. Words began to form in his mind, an incantation of sorts. He started chanting, his voice gaining strength and confidence with every word. The medallion glowed brighter, its light piercing through the vortex, creating a beacon for the lost souls. As the clock inched closer to midnight, the pull of the vortex intensified. But Corey stood his ground, his chant unwavering. The medallion's light began to draw the energy in, the whirlwind of spirits becoming a stream flowing into the artifact. Finally, as the clock struck twelve, with one final surge of power, the vortex sealed, the medallion absorbing all its energy. The fairgrounds, once pulsating with supernatural activity, now lay quiet and still. Exhausted but triumphant, Corey looked around. The spirit guide, now more distinct, approached him, gratitude evident in its form. Thank you, it whispered before fading away. As dawn approached, the State Fair of Texas resumed its festivities. The games, rides, and attractions buzzed with life but the dark undercurrent was gone. Corey had successfully sealed the spectral vortex, saving the fairgrounds from an eternal haunting. Chapter 13 A night in the fair the day's events had left Corey physically and emotionally drained. But he knew there was still work to be done. With the medallion's power to seal the spectral vortex now evident, he needed to find its source. And for that, he had to dive deep into the epicenter of the haunting. He decided to spend a night at the fairgrounds, alone, hoping to experience firsthand the intense paranormal activity that intensified under the cloak of darkness. As the last of the visitors left and the fairground lights dimmed, a palpable change swept the air. An eerie quiet descended broken only by the soft hum of distant generators and the occasional distant shout of a night security guard. The moon, nearly full, 
cast elongated shadows across the pathways. Corey set up his equipment in the center of the fairgrounds, with cameras and sensors pointing in all directions. As the clock inched towards midnight, the atmosphere grew thicker, and a mist began to rise from the ground. Corey's breath fogged up as he tried to adjust his equipment, its readings going haywire. Suddenly, he heard the faint strains of old-timey music playing from somewhere. Following the sound, he was led to the carousel. But it was different. Instead of the modern horses and chariots, it had intricate wooden designs, reminiscent of carousels from the early 1900s. Intrigued, Corey stepped on it. As soon as he did, the surroundings shifted. The modern booths and rides faded, replaced by simpler, older versions. People dressed in vintage clothing walked around, children laughing, couples holding hands, vendors shouting their wares. He had been transported to a different era of the fair. Walking around, Corey took in the sights and sounds. It was enchanting. Every so often, the scene would shift, transporting him to a different decade of the fair's rich history. From the jazz-filled 1920s to the vibrant 1960s, he experienced it all. But as fascinating as these glimpses into the past were, Corey knew he needed to find the Vortex's center. Lost in thought, he was approached by an elderly ghost, his semi-transparent form dressed in a well-tailored suit, a pocket watch chain dangling from his waistcoat. You seem lost, young man, the ghost remarked, his voice echoing slightly. I am, Corey replied. I'm trying to find the center of the vortex, to seal it. The ghost smiled, ah a noble endeavor. I've been here for a long time, watching the fair change and evolve. The vortex has always been here, but its power has grown over the years. The elderly spirit extended his hand, revealing a folded piece of paper. This might help you, he said, handing over what appeared to be a map of the fairgrounds. But it was different. There were intricate patterns and symbols drawn, with a glowing point in the center. This is where the vortex's energy is the strongest, the ghost pointed to the glowing point. But be careful. The closer you get, the more intense the experiences become. Corey nodded, gratitude evident in his eyes. Thank you. Do you have any advice for me? The spirit smiled his form starting to fade, believe in yourself. The fair spirits are not malevolent, they're just lost. Help them find their way. With the map in hand, Corey navigated his way towards the vortex's center. The mist grew thicker, voices whispered in his ears, and the shifting landscapes became more frequent and disorienting. But he persevered, holding onto the map like a lifeline. As he approached the glowing point, the ground beneath him trembled. The air pulsated with energy, and a swirling mass of lights and shadows appeared in front of him. This was it, the epicenter of the spectral vortex. Taking a deep breath, Corey summoned the courage and strength to approach the vortex. He held the medallion in one hand and the map in the other, ready to confront the intense energies head on. Chapter 14 Uniting the spirits with the vortex's center located and the medallion at the ready, Corey knew that sealing it wasn't as straightforward as just placing the artifact there. The spirits trapped within the vortex were the ones fueling its energy, and to seal it, he had to unite them to guide them towards the peace they had been denied for so long. Following the advice of the elderly ghost, Corey decided to return to each haunted attraction. He hoped to gather spirits and harness the energy of each location, 
converting it into a force that would help seal the vortex. His first stop was the Ferris Wheel of Souls. Revisiting the place brought back the haunting image of the translucent child he'd seen earlier. Calling upon the medallion's energy, he addressed the spirits of the Ferris Wheel. I'm here to help you find peace and to free the fair from this haunting. Join me, and together we can seal the vortex. Some spirits hesitated, but the vision of the child appeared, nodding at Corey. Encouraged by the child's acceptance, many spirits began to gather around Corey, their energies swirling, connecting with the medallion. As Corey moved from one attraction to another, the process was similar but not without challenges. At the carousel of time, the woman who'd been riding since the 60s approached him, her eyes filled with longing. I've seen so many fairs, so many happy faces. But I've been trapped here, watching the world change around me. With a deep breath, she added, I'm ready to move on. She, along with many others, joined Corey's growing parade of spirits. However, not all entities were cooperative. At the Phantom Food Court, the ghostly cook who'd vanished in the 80s resisted Corey's call, fiercely protective of his spectral domain. This is my home, my place. I won't leave. He exclaimed, sending waves of hostile energy towards Corey. Corey, using the combined energy of the spirits he'd gathered, approached the cook. I understand your attachment, but clinging on is causing pain to many others. You can find peace, just like the others. The cook's resistance faded as Corey's sincerity pierced through his anger and despair. Finally, with a sigh, he said, All right, I'll join, but only if I can lead the parade with my favorite dish. Corey chuckled, Deal. By the time Corey reached the ghostly hall of mirrors, he had a sizable group of spirits with him. Their combined energy created a spectacle, a spirit carnival parade glowing with ethereal light, illuminating the fairground. In front of the Hall of Mirrors, Corey saw his own reflection, the same one that had given him cryptic advice. It nodded, signaling the time had come. The spirits formed a line, passing through the hall, their energies being amplified by the mirrors. Each spirit's story, pain, and longing reflected in the mirrors, creating a tapestry of the fair's rich and haunted history. The climax was nearing. The spirit parade, led by the cook holding an ethereal dish, approached the vortex's center. Corey, holding the medallion high, chanted words inscribed on its back. The vortex responded, its swirling energy beginning to sync with the parade's rhythm. As the last of the spirits entered the vortex, a blinding light engulfed the fairgrounds. The ground trembled, the air crackled, and then, as suddenly as it began, everything went silent. The vortex had been sealed. Exhausted but victorious, Corey looked around. The fair, devoid of its spectral inhabitants, felt different, peaceful and pure. He knew his mission was a success. The State Fair of Texas was free from its hauntings. And as dawn broke, painting the sky in hues of orange and pink, Corey felt a deep satisfaction. The spirits had found their peace, and the fair could once again be a place of joy and wonder for all. Chapter 15. The Final Showdown, The State Fair of Texas, now deserted and eerily quiet in the pre-dawn hours, seemed to be holding its breath, waiting. Corey stood at the precipice of the vortex's heart, the swirling epicenter of all the paranormal activity he'd encountered. The energy was palpable, an electric tension in the air that made the hairs on the back of his neck stand on end. 
From the corner of his eye, Corey spotted apparitions beginning to manifest, their silhouettes shimmering in and out of the mist. They weren't the spirits he'd previously helped find peace. No. These were the ones held tight in the vortex's grip, spirits who were still very much conflicted and angry. In his hand, Corey clutched the medallion, feeling its steady pulse of energy. The map given to him by the elderly ghost was tucked securely in his pocket, and around his neck hung the pendant, a talisman he hoped would protect him from the spirit's malevolence. Suddenly, a deep rumble echoed through the fairgrounds. The spectral showdown was commencing. The spirits surged towards Corey, their forms shifting and merging, creating a massive entity that loomed over him. Their collective anguish resonated in a haunting chorus of whispers, cries, and screams. Corey knew he had to act fast. Planting his feet firmly on the ground, he began reciting the sealing ritual he'd learned from the various spirits and artifacts. The medallion glowed brighter with each word, casting a protective circle of light around him. The spirits, unable to penetrate the barrier, howled in frustration. But then, from deep within the vortex, another entity began to emerge. A monstrous, shadowy figure, with tendrils of dark mist swirling around it. The beast that had been mentioned to Corey. This wasn't just another lost spirit. This was the manifestation of the vortex's raw power a being created from all the pain, anger, and resentment of the trapped souls. The beast let out a deafening roar, and its eyes, two burning coals, fixed on Corey. The spirits that had been attacking him now seemed to cower in its presence, bending to its will. The beast lunged at Corey, attempting to break the protective circle. The medallion's light wavered under the assault, but Corey held firm, continuing his chant. Drawing strength from the pendant and guided by the map, Corey visualized the vortex's heart, seeing in his mind's eye the very core of its energy. The beast, sensing what he was trying to do, intensified its attack, tendrils of mist reaching for Corey, trying to pull him into the vortex. With a final, desperate shout, Corey thrust the medallion forward, directing all its energy at the beast. A blinding beam of light shot out, hitting the beast squarely in the chest. The fairgrounds shook with the force of their clash, a battle of light versus dark, of hope against despair. As the light and dark energies collided, a whirlwind of spectral colors erupted around them. Corey could see, Within this maelstrom, the individual spirits that made up the beast, each one fighting to break free from its influence. The beast roared in agony, its form starting to disintegrate, but it wasn't giving up without a fight. With one last, ferocious effort, it lunged at Cory, who, with all his might, pushed back using the medallion's power. And then, as suddenly as it started, it was over. The beast, unable to withstand the combined energies of the medallion, pendant, and Corey's determination, shattered into a million fragments, releasing the spirits it had held captive. The vortex, its driving force gone, began to close, its once violent swirls now slowing to gentle eddies. Corey, drained and exhausted, collapsed to the ground. Around him, the fairgrounds slowly came to life with the first light of dawn. Birds began to sing, and a gentle breeze rustled the trees. The State Fair of Texas, its haunting history now put to rest, was ready to welcome its visitors once again. And as Corey lay there, he felt a gentle touch on his shoulder. Looking up, he saw the translucent figure of the elderly ghost smiling down at him. Thank you, she whispered, 
before fading away, finally at peace. Corey, realizing the magnitude of what he'd accomplished, let out a sigh of relief. The fair was saved, the spirits freed, and the beast vanquished. He knew his work here was done. With a newfound sense of purpose, Corey got to his feet, ready to face whatever other paranormal challenges lay ahead. Chapter 16 Dawn breaks the early rays of sunlight gently kissed the State Fair of Texas, casting long golden beams across the grounds. Ride stood still in silent anticipation, stalls slowly began to awaken, and the aroma of food started to waft through the air. Everything looked normal. But Corey, gazing across the grounds from a vantage point, remained on edge. The fair might seem tranquil, but the night's intense showdown with the beast was still fresh in his mind. He found it hard to believe that it was truly over, that the vortex and the haunting were things of the past. He began to walk through the fair, the sounds of preparations filling the air. Vendors set up their stalls, rides were given a preliminary run, and excited families began to trickle in, eager for the day's adventures. Everywhere Corey looked, people were laughing, chatting, and planning their day. No whispers of mysterious mists, no wary glances at rides. Just the usual, joyous anticipation that the state fair always evoked. As he walked past the carousel, Corey noticed the familiar soft melody of its tune. He approached hesitantly, memories of the woman stuck in the sixties flashing through his mind. But as he drew closer, he noticed her standing beside the ride, no longer a mere apparition, but a spirit glowing with an ethereal light. Corey, she called out, her voice melodious. He approached her cautiously. You're different. The woman smiled, a gentle and serene expression. I am free, thanks to you. The carousel no longer holds me prisoner. I can finally move on. As she spoke, Corey noticed other spirits he'd encountered, the child from the Ferris wheel, the cook from the food court, and many others. They all looked at him with gratitude, their forms radiant in the dawn light. Suddenly, the old coaster worker stepped forward, his form more solid than the others, almost lifelike. Corey, he nodded, last night was, something else. We were trapped, unable to move on. But you've given us peace. Corey looked at the spirits, a mix of emotions swirling within him. I'm just glad I could help, he replied, his voice thick. The old worker reached into his pocket and pulled out a small, intricately designed charm. I want you to have this, he said, handing it to Corey. It's been in my family for generations. It protected me when I was alive, and even in death. I believe it'll serve you well. Corey took the charm, feeling its weight and warmth in his hand. Thank you, he whispered, his eyes moist. The spirits began to fade, their mission accomplished, their ties to the fair severed. Remember us, the woman from the carousel whispered as she vanished, and the stories we shared. As the spirits disappeared, Corey was left alone the charm clenched tightly in his hand. The sounds of the fair, the laughter and chatter, slowly filtered back into his consciousness. Looking around, he saw families enjoying rides, children with cotton candy, couples holding hands, a picture of normalcy. Corey smiled, realizing that the fair was indeed back to its former glory, free from the shackles of its haunted past. With the protective charm in his pocket and a renewed sense of purpose, he walked into the crowd, ready to enjoy the State Fair of Texas like everyone else. Chapter 17 
Farewell to the fair, the fairground was bustling with activity, alive with the sounds of laughter, excited chatter, and the distant hum of rides. As Corey stood at a distance, he reflected on the incredible journey he'd embarked upon, and the spirits he had set free. Despite the horrors and challenges he'd faced, there was a sense of accomplishment that filled his heart. The past days had been a whirlwind of spectral encounters and paranormal mysteries. Now, standing amidst the very heart of it all, he felt a profound connection to the fairground and its history. But he also realized that it was time for him to move on. His job here was done, and other paranormal challenges awaited him. As he made his way towards the exit, he was stopped by the enthusiastic shouts of the newcomer family he had seen on the opening day. The Johnsons, unaware of the spectral turmoil that had consumed the fair before their visit, only had memories of a delightful experience. Hey, Corey! Mr. Johnson exclaimed, patting him on the back. We wanted to thank you. My kids can't stop talking about how magical their experience was. Mrs. Johnson, with their youngest on her hip, smiled warmly. We've been to many fairs, but there's something truly special about this one. Thank you for recommending the best attractions. Corey chuckled. I'm just glad you had a great time. The State Fair of Texas is a gem, and I'm pleased you got to experience its magic. As they continued to exchange pleasantries, the Johnson's middle child, a precocious seven-year-old named Lucy, tugged at Corey's pants. Mister, she began, her voice filled with the innocence of childhood, I drew something for you. She handed Corey a folded piece of paper. As he opened it, his heart skipped a beat. It was a drawing of the fair, complete with rides, stalls, and smiling stick figures representing her family. But in the background, slightly faded, was an ethereal figure, a spirit, watching over the festivities with a benevolent gaze. Corey's eyes met Lucis. This is beautiful, he whispered, sensing the depth behind her drawing. Who's this? he asked, pointing to the ghostly figure. Lucy shrugged her face a picture of innocence. I don't know. I just felt like drawing him. He seemed. Nice. Corey felt a shiver run down his spine. Had he missed something? Were there more spirits still tied to the fair? He decided to keep the drawing, a reminder that the world of the paranormal was vast and unpredictable. As the Johnsons waved him goodbye, Corey took one last look at the fairground. The sun was setting, casting a golden hue over everything. With a heavy heart and mixed emotions, he made his way out, the drawing clutched tightly in his hand. The road ahead was long, filled with unknown challenges and mysteries. But Corey was ready. With the experiences of the State Fair of Texas behind him, he was more determined than ever to delve deeper into the paranormal world, to free trapped spirits and ensure that places like the fair remain sanctuaries of joy and celebration. As the fairground's lights began to twinkle in the twilight, Corey stepped into his car, driving off into the horizon, ready for the next big paranormal adventure. The drawing on the passenger seat served as a poignant reminder that sometimes, the story isn't truly over, even when it feels like it is. Chapter 18 Epilogue months had passed since Corey's fateful experience at the State Fair of Texas. The intense Texas sun continued to shine down on the bustling fairgrounds, where laughter and joy echoed uninterrupted by spectral disruptions or mysterious occurrences. Families reveled in the thrill of the rides, tasted the myriad delicacies, and won prizes at game booths. 
The shadow of the past hauntings seemed to have lifted, replaced with an atmosphere of pure festivity. In the heart of Dallas, locals whispered tales of the haunted fairgrounds at dinner tables and gatherings. From children daring each other to spend a night in the cursed beer garden, to adults sharing stories of the ghostly cook from the 80s, the legends of the fair had cemented their place in Texas folklore. Yet, for most attendees, these were just stories, entertaining tales to be shared but never truly believed. Corey's journey, however, had not ended with his departure from the fair. Compiling his documentation, interviews, footage, and personal experiences, he authored a book titled, The Spectral State Fair, A Paranormal Investigation. To his surprise, it became an instant hit, flying off the shelves and quickly ascending to bestseller status. Readers were captivated by the blend of history, paranormal encounters, and Corey's own personal journey. His detailed descriptions, supported by evidence, transformed skeptics into believers. Book signings and interviews became a regular part of Corey's life. Yet, even amidst this newfound fame, he remained humble and dedicated to his mission of understanding and aiding the spirit realm. His adventures at the fair had only solidified his determination making him more attuned to the unseen world around him. One balmy evening, a year after Corey's experiences, the State Fair of Texas unveiled its latest attraction. A massive billboard heralded the Maze of Memories, an intricate labyrinth designed to take visitors on a journey through the fair's rich history. Crowds thronged the entrance, eager to be among the first to experience this new marvel. As the sun dipped below the horizon, the maze's lights illuminated, casting a soft glow over the fairgrounds. Inside, visitors wandered through corridors adorned with photographs, artifacts, and snippets of history. Sounds of the past, from the jubilant music of the 60s to the whispers of fairgoers from a century ago, played softly in the background. At the very heart of the maze, a particularly darkened corner led to an ornate mirror framed in gold. Unlike the other exhibits, there was no plaque or description for this piece. Yet, something about it drew visitors close, compelling them to gaze into its depths. And as the night wore on, a young couple stood before the mirror, lost in its beauty. They laughed discussing their day and the fun they had experienced. Just as they were about to move on, the woman froze, her eyes locked on the reflection. Did you hear that? She whispered to her partner. He looked at her quizzically. Hear what? A soft, barely audible whisper floated through the air, emanating from the mirror. The story isn't over. The couple exchanged nervous glances, the weight of the legends suddenly feeling all too real. They quickly left the maze, the mysterious whisper lingering in their ears. Elsewhere, Corey received news of the new attraction and smiled to himself. The State Fair of Texas had once again captured his curiosity. It seemed his journey with the fair wasn't quite finished. The spirits, it appeared, still had tales to tell. And Corey? He was all ears, ready for the next chapter of this endless adventure. Morale of the story. Even in the midst of mysteries and the unknown, the pursuit of understanding and connection can bring light to the darkest corners. Embracing the past, with all its tales and spirits, allows for healing and growth ensuring that history's lessons are never forgotten and that its spirits find peace. If you have enjoyed our paranormal scary story about the activities of the State Fair of Texas, please visit us at Paranormal Untold Stories. Come to listen to more of our Scary Stories collection. Paranormal. 
Untold Stories encourages you to contact us if you have your own untold story that you would like our professionals team to put online as a scary story. Thank you. Please follow our YouTube channel, Paranormal Untold Stories, and encourage others to do the same. Paranormal Untold Stories